Um, welcome everybody back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY. This is our third week where we uh, hear from artists and actually listen to them and their voices in this uh, time um, of Corona, this uh, time where the reality is truly stranger than fiction and within a th very, very short time uh, things have moves, moved in directions nobody ever could have thought. I'm sure not the last time we all saw each other here in, in New York. Um, we had uh, um, participants from all over the world, from Lebanon and Egypt, Taiwan, Hong Kong, China, from uh, Germany and Italy and, and everywhere. And, um, and so we're taking the temperature to see, you know, how, how does it feel like being uh, at home uh, for an artist, for a theater artist? How is this mood in the streets in the city? What is on artist's mind, theater artist's mind, we hear so much from politicians and economic advisors and neurologists, but this is a time, if ever, we need to hear from the arts. I feel it is now. And, um, and often, very, very often, theater artists and artists are the ones who are right when it comes to history. And, uh, and um, so um, we get an update now from New York City. New York has over 10,000 dead people. It has more New York State of New York, so we have more dead people than most countries or every country in the world. It's, uh, uh, of course, five and a half million people. You have used the subway every day, 3,000 people coming out of Penn Station, people living close to each other. And here in New York, we do love to go out and party and create work together and talk and communicate. And uh, this time, this all works in a way against us. And um, so with us, we have today um, two, two groups who are the bedrock in a way also of, of New York City's theater, of the experimental scene, of the uh, scene that really um, is uh, creating work that doesn't replicate what's already there, that like doesn't do adaptations of what we already know about. They have been disruptors, they have created things that are new. And um, we always use that old Brecht quote to say new times need new forms of theater. And um, I guess we all live in a new time, uh, like there was before and after World War II, before and after Berlin Wall opened, perhaps before and after 9-11, and now we have this. So um, theater people are, normally we do complain there's no space, we don't have money, there's not possible to do work now, there is really no space to do work, there is really no money for a long time, but still we are with us and uh, we are always inside the same, that's what Gertrude Stein said, uh, from early age on, we are actually who we are. So I would love to hear from, from you and, uh, and maybe we start with Annie B. How, how are you and how, how is Annie B doing? The choreographer and the co-director and co-founder of Big Dance Theater and uh, who have here with us Ms. Paul Lazar and uh, of course, you know, Kelly Cooper and Pavel uh, from the great uh, Nature Theater of Oklahoma, but Annie, um, What's going on? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I suppose I'm a little speechless because, um, you know, the, the issue, there's a lot of language that's come up around this, this experience that we're having that's new or ha is very choreographic. And, and because so much is going on, um, you know, and it's emphasized in this tragedy between the, about the haves and the haves nots, I feel a little hesitant to speak on formal, on informal terms, really. Mm. But, but um, because that's my business, it does occur to me every day that there's a lot of choreographic language flying around, a lot of body awareness, spatial awareness, um, issues of presence, um, you know, six feet, for instance, distance where people are getting really good at that and as a choreographer you know of course I find that interesting it's one of my really favorite proximities I find that really elegant six feet um, you know issues of the body and space distancing separation these are all choreographic ideas that everybody's now having to deal with uh, so you know and I do feel funny talking about formal structural things in the face of so much suffering. But you know, um, on a personal level, um, I'm lucky to be fine. I turned down a lot of teaching work in order to get in a room with some sweaty bodies and rehearse, which obviously isn't happening. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's okay. I feel like 
it's okay not to generate tons of quick videos and stuff and just, you know, kind of be here now. <laughs> so where are you now in your apartment? Where is it in New York City? We're in Brooklyn. Um, yeah. Where? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where, yeah. Uh, in, I live in Cobble Hill and it's, you know, pretty much, I guess, like everywhere else, you know, people walking out to take walks and then coming out at 7 p.m. to do the most beautiful art piece ever met, political art piece, art piece of compassion, the, the group clap. Mm -hmm. So you participate in it and... Yeah, every night. We really look forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. So how is the mood on the street in Brooklyn? What do you see? Uh -huh. Wow, people don't, don't, I feel like pay enough attention to the protocols that are being suggested or implement, supposed to be implemented by the mayor. Um, you see like 50% of people wearing masks, um, people dodging each other. That dance of getting around each other is happening a little bit, but um, I wish it was happening more. And it's pretty quiet. And the air, I mean, the silver lining is the air is beautiful. Yeah, no cars. No cars, no, no, no industry. No, no, no pollution. Yeah, Kelly, um, where are you now and how, how, how does it feel for you? Um, I'm out in Long Island City in Queens. Um, so the place where we live is, um, is kind of more of an industrial area. The, uh, so I, I noticed the, I can hear birds and things like that. Right. Um, yeah, so the, that's nice. And it's funny, I didn't think so much about the body spacing and things like that and people having to be aware of other bodies in space, but I really, for me, I can't stand the masks. I just, I miss being able to read faces. I find I don't really know, um, I don't really, I don't really know how to interact very well without faces. It's hard to read eyes and people are covered up. Some of them like, you know, Pavel saw the other day, like people wearing two or three layers of masks, you know, I, I guess um, I miss, I just realized that like so much of the expression that people have is below their, <laughs> below their nose. And I miss that. I miss being able to see people smile or to, to know how they, how they're, how they're taking whatever I'm saying or, um, but I really, I like, I've become much more aware of the animal life and things like that. We have some beautiful bird song that I've never heard before. And I really enjoy people use their dogs as a, an excuse to get out outside. And I've been taking, my way to get through all of this really has been to take really long walks through the city. So I, I walk sometimes three, four hours at a stretch um, just to get out. Um, and we also installed a, uh, we had a walking treadmill that we bought a, a, a while ago to um, walk and write at the same time. And that has come in real handy too on days when it, you just can't get out. I just miss being able to move. <laughs> mm -hmm. So where do you walk and um, what do you think about when you're walking? Um, for me, it's just like, I, I miss like the information um, so I, you know, it's been nice to like see the, the leaves coming out and the flowers right now is tulip season. So there's all this color all of a sudden. Um, also to notice, I mean, I started walking really like around March 13th. Um, and it, at first people were much closer together and now sometimes I walk and I barely see anyone and there's no cars. So it's just gotten much more stark. Um, and I, I walk from Queens, usually over the Pulaski Bridge into Brooklyn, over the Williamsburg Bridge through Manhattan and back over the Queensboro Bridge is one of my favorites. It's just a nice loop and it takes you through three boroughs. So. Yeah, and it's things you notice in the city, things that are different. Uh, definitely, the mm -hmm. yeah, the sirens. Um, I noticed I saw a lot of fire fire trucks and things like that. And then I read that it was because people were, um, people who had never cooked before are cooking. And there's a lot of um, house fires, I guess, are up too, because we're not very good cooks. 
in New York. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, olive oil in flames, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, and I've noticed that, uh, you know, when I do have to get out, I, I have a motorcycle. And so, um, you know, sometimes I, I get on the road to, you know, go get groceries or toilet paper or something. And I notice that people are much, much more free and easy about the, at least the traffic laws. Like I saw, you know, one guy pulled up next to me, stopped at the stoplight, and then just blew blew through. You know, it's just I think there's a little bit of a as we get into more and more weeks of this of of a like what the hell um, kind of attitude. Mm. And and a friend of mine in, who lives in. Um, in Midtown said that there's like a lot of drag racing and stuff late at night. Uh, oh. So I'm, I'm interested in the, you know, like what's the progression of lawlessness because as much as, you know, Annie B said that people aren't really following the protocol and um, I, I have a little trouble with it too. I mean, I know it's good and we've got to follow the rules and stuff, but like everything in my artwork is kind of about like figuring out what the rules are and breaking them. <laughs> Um, so I, I chafe a little bit at all of the rules and it's interesting to see how people respond to like such a, a, a more a hardcore structure um, for um, social experience. And yeah, I, I don't think it's good that people are blowing through the, the, the red lights and stuff, but it, it is interesting to see the choices that people make and at what point um, their risk versus reward uh, Kind of trips over and they they start start being more reckless. Mm. So, Pavel, what what do you do? And uh, especially when Kelly is off with your motorcycle or something, what how 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 is it in um, being confined? You are also a group that you know you work so much in Europe. Uh, one of the few also New York groups that does tour and has such a global reach in a way. How 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 does it feel to be in the apartment? It feels the same as it always does, because when we are in New York, generally I stay inside the apartment constantly. The food is delivered um, and I never leave sometimes for weeks at a time. So it's, it's exactly the same. But I was in Europe um, during the outbreak and uh, I was in Slovakia and then the border was closed in Slovakia and I had a flight out of Vienna. And so I was able to, I would be able to leave Slovakia but not come back. But then the next day, Austrians closed the border. So I couldn't leave Slovakia and go into Austria. So my sister and brother dropped me off at a field on the border and I walked across the field 10 kilometers with my suitcases to the nearest town. So it just felt, uh, it just felt like a uh, cold war <laughs> when, when uh, people were immigrating from Eastern Europe. Um, so I was able to see also the differences between, between how um, former communist countries deal with the virus and and here you know i think every I, I read somewhere that the eastern europe european countries have been able to contain the pandemic a little bit better than the western countries because i think the people are um, used to obeying so ever and also also uh telling on each other so when when uh, somebody is disobeying the rules Either they report them or everybody just uh, is used to uh, receiving orders from, from the government and just doing what, the, what they're told. And um, so maybe that's, that's uh, one advantage of living in a totalitarian regime is that you learn how to obey. Um, but like Kelly said, it's, it's, I love wearing the mask because we found these masks in Asia one time years ago that say okay on it. So it's a, it's, it's a great swag, um, but uh, you know, it's hard to breathe. But I'm, I'm, we, nothing has really changed for me other than just the awareness of, of 
or just the, the knowing what's going on in the world and and uh, how and we're working on a new project that's somewhat related or or just thinking how to how to you know what how how do how do we get how do we get back together especially now just uh, worrying about um, not worrying about it existentially that oh shit we won't be able to make our stupid little show but just are we ever going to be able to get back together and be in close proximity with other human beings which is which is really what the work is about you know it's not about uh, making little tv shows for the internet you know that's that that is not what we that is not what we do what, what we do is really a social experience so all of this is really um, endangering our reason for for making any kind of work um, it's not just what's what's on the screen or what's on stage but we really care about what's actually happening in the audience our, our theater is going to be rearranged in the way that 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 people are seated you know, is there going to have to be every you know two-thirds of all the seats in the theaters will they have to be removed so that there's enough distance between everyone is everyone before they can enter a theater going to have to show proof that they don't have any disease that that, that can infect everybody else in the theater um, is is there going to have to be some kind of a plexiglass barrier in front of the stage separating the audience like richard <laughs> exactly that's what i thought it's like wow, richard, richard could do his shows right now and it's all it would be all hey. oh, great <laughs> and and just just but then thinking also is is do we what kind of if if the giant theaters can never reopen which is fine i never really unless i went to uh see uh um balanchine with annie b uh, oh, nice. I, I, yeah and I, I, other, than, other than that i never really go to big theaters i just go with annie b uh, <laughs> um are we going to start having kind of secret dissident performances in our in our apartments or in in the basements is the is the experimental or avant-garde work going to really take on much more uh, much bigger importance than it has had in the set in the last years uh, do we do we uh, stage things in people's apartments you know which is which to me is uh, an exciting prospect um, because I do feel that unless unless we are able to get people into the same space, that the work that we do is is meaningless. To, to at least to at least to me, mm -hmm. you know, I'd rather yeah. just then write novels, because it it uh, I'm not really interested in creating content for the internet or or making television shows. Uh, mm -hmm. Paul, what what comes to your mind? What comes to my mind? Yeah, when you hear your, 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 your of course, your partner, but also your, your friends and being in New York City, being uh, in your apartment. Yeah. What, what uh, is on your mind? Yeah. The rhythm of this conversation is, is kind of cool. The way that um, because of the constraint of the technology, we're talking way differently than we would if the five of us were hanging out we do that New York thing of kind of blabbing on top of each other. So I'm digging, um, I'm digging the, um, this, the formality of this conversation um, that, you know, formality imposed by, a, by this authentic constraint of the, the technology will flip, will get all fucked up if we talk at once makes us each hold forth in this separate way. And I'm hearing aspects of everybody that I probably would not be um, that um, aware of if I if we didn't say, okay, now it's your turn to say your thoughts, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. 
And um, you were at the end of the, yeah. Yeah, right. So mm -hmm. I got, as each person talked, and they were all so cool and smart, I got more and more nervous with each, yeah. uh, with each one. We can take off our shirts. Yeah. <laughs> woo, woo. That's kind of a uh, standard use of video, I think. Mm. Uh, but it could be lucrative. Yeah, how is it for you as a creative mind, you know, as a, well, a, a thinker? Or you are a thinker of theaters, everybody here, you know, and uh, what does it do to you? Well, it was, uh, I kind of lucked out in that, and you know, my company has been around about 26, some huge amount of time. Uh, and um, so as a, De great desire was gradually um, accumulating in me to, to be by myself. And so starting a few years back, I started to make this solo called Cage Shuffle, where I put all these John Cage um, one minute stories on, on my, uh, uh, as a playlist on my iPod and I speak them as I hear them. And I do a dance at the same time. And the, 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 the Gage stories are come in random order. So how they uh, match up with the dance is different with every performance. And it required to, to do that. It's a bit of a pat your stomach and rub your head type thing to the max. So to create this piece, I had to spend a lot of time alone in my house. And so I was already in the mode of working by myself for a couple of years. Uh, having made Cage Shuffle, and I had just agreed to do the Cage Shuffle Marathon, where I'm going to do 90 of these one-minute Cage stories, which requires 90 minutes of dance. So I have uh, more than enough to do by myself in a room. Uh, so on that level, it's it's sort of like uh, Pavel was saying is what else is new? You know what I mean? It's um, business as usual uh, in that sense. But um, the, the di difference is, well, you can't dance by yourself alone in a room without killing your hip, my left hip <laughs> that is, for more than a couple hours max. So the rest of the time, um, Annie and I were, uh, making masks uh we had a sewing machine but it broke so now we're down to um sewing by hand so we're moving backwards to the you know medieval um um technologies um and uh reading way more um i had this funny um this funny um marriage of two things that seem disparate and then end up being so in concert with one another. What I mean is, and this is going to sound very highfalutin, uh, but I happened to be reading uh, Antony and Cleopatra. And um, I never knew Cleopatra is such a fucking kick. She's outrageous. I mean, I think that uh, one of these wonderful drag queens like Taylor Mack could be an inhabit Cleopatra. She is just out of control. She, well, uh, Harold Bloom says uh, exuberant narcissism, which is, I think, so beautiful. Anyway, I'm reading that and I'm watching this documentary about Irene Fornes and uh, this thing of exuberant narcissism um, is um, just very prevalent in my mind and how, how thrilling that is when it's when the exuberant narcissism is manifest in somebody like um, Irene Fornes or, you know, certain artists can, or politicians or personalities can exhibit exuberant narcissism in a, in a rather uh, thrilling way. Mm. Um, one question, if I may ask, you both are also couples, creative couples, you know, like Judas Molina or Julian Beck or Mario Martinelli, who we had here on Miss Armana. Montanari from Italy and uh, how does it how is it to you already work together but now you are confined you can't go out it, does it have an effect on your life or is it a time you say this is something we normally don't have uh, how, how is that working for you all 
Nobody's answering. <laughs> I think Annie can, can, can field that one. Well, Paul mentioned that he, you asked, Paul mentioned that he's working on dances for his piece. And um, the first iteration of the piece, I had choreographed the first 30 minutes of the dance. Um, it's his piece, but he asked me for choreography. So I would just give him these one minute segments of, and I know Pavel's a choreographer too, so I'm curious how he feels about this, but now, I literally can't even touch it. Like, I don't want to make dance right now. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to think about like that whole enterprise. And I think it's a little bit because of what Pavel's saying of just like, I need to be in a room. I need to like really, you know, I need the whole thing. I, I really, I need my dancers in the room. I need, you know, to know how long I have. I need to prepare. I need to, you know, and right now it's just, everything feels very liminal and floaty. Um, and I am working on, on some projects on my own, but they're not choreography. Um, but these are the couple thing. I think we're working separately um, pretty much, wouldn't you say? We read a play together yesterday, but mostly we're working separately. Yeah, yeah strangely enough. How about you guys? Um, we're, we're writing the new, new, new text for the new show and um, Kelly writes something, gives it to me, I write, I go over it, give it back to her and we just uh, pass it back and forth and we read and we, you know, it's, it is, it is uh, what we do for 90% of the year is solitary work anyway. You know, it's not, uh, so it's, it's, it's just the, it's just the payoff that is being threatened. Everything else really is, is how we, how we work. And, yeah, and we're, sometimes we're always, we're always in the same, for the most part, apartment and, you know, we don't, uh, really, it's not a, it's not a change other than the content. What were you saying, Kelly? Oh, just like I think, I think anybody that works together as a couple making theater, you know, it's like sometimes you're on top of each other in a hotel room or like in a plane. Or like it, you spend a lot of intense time together like this, and so in that way, it's really like if you if you manage. It's because you have some strategies for getting through this kind of intensely like four hour walks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes it's great to get out and give each other a little space if you can. Yeah. I guess from having made so much work together, these two couples, that is, maybe we're more prepared for this uh, collective quarantine than, yeah. than people that don't work together. Yeah, I, I would really do think so. And uh, it's uh, one of the sad things in the Corona time that we all do think, oh, people go back to their families and their partners and they stay at home, but a lot of people do not have partners or families. They're not married and they often they can't yeah. see each other. They don't get in France or Italy. They cannot visit each other because they're not formally married or maybe people have multiple partners. And uh, so it's a, it's a, a very, a very complicated time for many, many people next to others. How is it for you work-wise? Your, have your commissions been uh, uh, stable? Well, actually, there's uh, one thing I wanted to mention. Yeah. It's related, but not exactly, which is that I think that out of a legitimate fear, which is like, as uh, Pavel said, the commissions or the, the thing that's being threatened is the having a future, having, you know, gigs and having a, being in the game when all, when all this passes, still being, having a platform, I guess is the word. And out of that desperation or anxiety about that, I think people are making work just to get their face, keep their face out there. Mm -hmm. And I, I relate deeply to that anxiety, but I do, despair a bit about the amount of uh, quickly, quickly uh, thrown together 
online crap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, our it's work a, takes time. Temptation, but yeesh. takes time. Yeah. There are no shortcuts, and, no. and there's a lot of stuff being thrown up, as well as these, these videos of pieces with like, that were really just documents of the work with like two cameras shit far away that people are supposed to watch in replacement of being in the room with the piece. Um, you know, that beautiful triangle of the piece and the audience and the artist and that interaction, I think that's, I don't mean to speak for you, Pablo, but what you were afraid of losing. Um, yeah, because you know, we, yeah, thanks, okay. <laughs> Um, um, I totally agree, and I guess I initiated this little beat, but at the same time, there's a few incredible opportunities, viewing-wise, uh, I experienced, so I have to mention that as well, which is that, for example, Mabu Minds, because of, you know, a lot of people are posting things from their archives, mm -hmm. and Mabu Minds posted, um, and incredibly compromised, of course, because of the technology. But from 1975, a performance by uh, David Warlow, uh, directed by uh, Lee Brewer of uh, the Beckett uh, prose piece, The Lost Ones. And for all, for as compromised as it is, David Warlow's no longer alive. You know, there's so much, it, it, it's a piece that I saw live uh, at the public theater in 76. It was life changing for me. So I don't know, when I watch it, I see that the video is barely even viewable. But, and maybe it's only if you've seen it live, but the fact that there's an opportunity to see that piece, I can't recommend it enough. And the things that the Worcester Group is posting. So this thing of bringing things out of the archive given that it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it is video, but it's also a bit of an opportunity to look back at these archival things that are kind of amazing to the extent that you can kind of cons imagine what it maybe was live. Yeah, and I think whatever you were saying, Paul, about like people trying to keep their Kind of face out there to keep some kind of like keep the keep the um, the idea of the virtual store still being open right <laughs> um, I think maybe in an, in New York and stuff that that panic is even heightened also by the fact that you know everybody's backup job or the thing that I used to say is like uh, you know if I stop being able to make a buck with theater I can still I can still like wait tables and now, of course, that's also gone. And so right. the level, the level of panic here in New York, I think, is especially a really good point because of that. But you know, in a weird flip side of that, is like now that everybody's day job is gone, I really like the fact that you know you kind of have this resurgence of boredom because there's only so much like social media crap that you can do in a day. And so people are reading books or like, you know, there's a friend of mine that, um, you know, was working at a coffee, coffee place, like, you know, 40 hours plus a week. And now all of a sudden he's drawing all of these amazing things. And I see his drawings again and people are like doing stuff like sculpture and, um, you know, they're, they're finding ways to be creative again because they've actually been given their time back. And, and we all have this kind of like, you have that moment where it's like, well, I, what do I want to do <laughs> um, creatively that we haven't, because we're all on this kind of treadmill all the time, even if you are able to do your art for, for, for pay, <laughs> you know, you still like, you end up chasing like the next job instead of maybe what you would most passionately care about. So I appreciate that too. But there's also a provisional nature to it that you don't have to, that there's an excuse. It's almost like it's, it's a holiday. So mm -hmm. the excuse is that it doesn't really have to be good as long as it's something. Um, it doesn't have to be rigorous. I just have to respond somehow just to, just to make sure that everybody knows that I'm around and I'm important and I, 
I'm a, I have something to say rather than just a, a time to um, reflect or just to pull back and, and actually let and pay attention and, and let, let the world feed. You know, I'm, I'm just mainly worried about like once we do start rehearsing uh, or working with people, are, how does that, how is that going to change? How is this going to change the dynamic of what can you ask people to do? Is, is close contact with, you know, is contact improv even going to be illegal? <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's, it's for uh, the best if it's yeah not. no for sure for sure <laughs> um but any kind of uh you know is is do we have to rehearse with masks are actors even going to be willing to to rehearse are you putting putting actors at risk by making them get close to other people other actors you know do you do you have to ask uh, for a written permission for consent? We need consent forms to ask uh, someone to stand next to each other. Or even like going out into the audience, like having actors touch audience members is also going to be, I think, a, a big, <laughs> you know, the people who can't consent that you attack with the. Yeah, the splash zone has to yeah. be. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it will be, I think there will be a dramatic consequence. If I understand right, Germany just announced till the summer of next year, there will be no big mass uh, spectacles, soccer games or others. So I guess what will happen to opera houses and theaters that's, you know, also so many people get together, will it be a year um, without this? What will it also mean in New York for the commercial theater? So much of New York theater is commercial only. To make money is not being supported. So of course it's... Uh, uh, being taken away, the idea. So will people then stop doing theater? And then will the people like you guys who make theater because out of out of a, a vision, out of a love, out of a out of a commitment, and because you have to, um, you know, will will be the ones perhaps doing the theater and uh, the circumstances you only have done it in smaller spaces with small audiences. Um, do you feel? Something is changing in your, is it still too early, but do you feel in your work, in your thinking about work, something is, is turning? Or is it more as you always said, well, it's more or less, it feels the same as it was before, just it's a bit uncertain. Or do you feel also the engagement now with the world, what you hear, what you listen, do you feel there is a reformatting of the internal hard drive? Yeah, I, I feel like we were already on the edge of, something like this because we, we had been making like film as also live work but um like the film in a perverse way like made the desire to make live work even more uh urgent and then this happened so then mm. live work is not even possible anymore um and you know hugging a friend is not even possible anymore so it makes all of that um you know it makes you think about well what what is the essential thing about the work that you make and it's time and people in space and all of those things are like gathering people <laughs> together is never it's like totally impossible so if that's the essential like for me that is the essential part of the live work like if you can't gather people together this disappears um so that makes it makes me want to do it more <laughs> but it also like it cuts it cuts away all of the other aspects like i you know we, i guess when we were talking when we were talking about the german theater about um that's commissioning the next work um you know the question was if we can't if we can't manage to raise the money that we need to do this will we do it anyway and it's like as long as we can pay the people we'll just do it in our t-shirts and with no set you know, like that's the inessential part that we can cut away. So it, it makes you, it forces you to think about what it, what it is that, what it is that you do and what do you need to do it. I do agree that um, the subject matter that we're being forced to confront was in the consciousness prior to the pandemic. I mean, I had this freaky experience, which is um, the biggest gig that, that, that for me that was canceled was um, directing Macbeth and it was <laughs> gonna be in Australia. 
and I was rehearsing it here in New York. And we, uh, the, the thing takes place in a basement. And the beginning of the piece, the person who plays Macbeth enters from the outside world. We started working on this a um, few months, four or five months ago. So we said he should be in a hazmat suit coming in from the outside world because we should presume that the world outside of this basement where this takes place is no longer habitable. So now this happens and that production is postponed, but I can't do the hazmat suit if it ever happens because now that's what the audience is gonna be wearing or something. <laughs> So I started thinking, well, what would an Elizabethan hazmat suit be? <laughs> so, but anyway, so I guess that's by way of saying it, it's, um, you know, this is, um, this is more the culmination or, or, a, or a first manifestation perhaps of something that's very in our consciousness. I mean, I often think, or I've, it's gone through my mind a few times uh, that, this interlude is like a kiss on the cheek compared to the way it's going to manifest when global warming finally finally comes to full fruition. It won't be so uh, enjoyably um, uh -huh. discreet from the bulk of the population. It'll be what's happening to the worst of us will be happening to all of us. Uh, so it's already part of the dark, painful, maddening cultural conversation. Yeah, so do yeah. we, should, in case it goes on with theater, should we then do different, different work than we have done before? Have we been ready for, for kind of situation what we are in or what we might be facing i mean i guess we as paul said about the hazmat suit and in some case in some ways i feel like we've been intuiting i mean i had you know just piggyback it just separately had a, about six months ago ordered a mask from japan that was flowers to match the dress of the costume because i wanted my dancers to wear matching masks and dresses but i wasn't like thinking oh this is gonna like corona's coming it's just there's mm -hmm. a few you know this has just been in the air so uh, to speak so to speak yeah but i mean if we can't gather in a room together to make things and we can't gather in a room to watch things um the idea that we're then reduced to uh, computer screens and technology, um, it, it, it seems, it's, I like better Pavel's idea of, of doing illicit theater um, in somebody's basement and not being, you know, then, then just giving up everything to, to the screen, screen world. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. there are so many, there are so many people who have already been doing internet art, and they're so much better than us. We're just uh, abysmal amateurs at it, and probably what theater people are putting on the internet is is abysmally Laughable. amateurish. Yeah. And uh, you know, there's 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 experts who who know how to do it and who have. Who have put in years since the beginning of just as we have put in years in exploring this art form, um, and should and should continue to really uh, work within the limitations and figure it out. You know, I uh, what is what is available, and then work with that. And yeah, I, I think that. Sorry, no, I just. I, no, you're my dad, so you have to. I mean, you should jump in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know if the audience, the, the hell around audience knows that, but Pavel is my son. <laughs> it's true. And I'm very proud of him most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I do think that, um, as Danny said at the very beginning, playing with proximity in live space, in, in a, you know, in, in, um, in three-dimensional world is a constraint, but it isn't a um, eradication. In other words, I remember seeing when I was, I don't know, Pavel's age, seeing, um, uh, 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 damn it, uh, Bread and Puppet Theater in Glover, Vermont, and this incredible image of these people about a quarter mile away coming very, very slowly toward the audience. Now the audience could have all been standing, we were probably standing a little bit closer together, but that's an example that already has happened in theater history of people oh. playing with proximity within the constraints of six foot distance. So it's the new constraint. It's the form, it's the sonnet, you know, it's the rules of the sonnet, you know, or whatever you want to, Thing of form you want to um, analogize. But anyway, uh, and, and I think it's always exciting when there's a constraint. So I think it's a possibility. There's possibility and promise with saying we've got to stand, um, we got to be outdoors and we got to be more than six feet away. That doesn't mean we all just go home and stop making theater. We just <clears throat> live within that. Piece yeah, of cake. Yeah, I mean, there's also the famous TV show Six Feet Under, you know, which of course um, <laughs> refers to the six feet distance, you know, of the dead towards yeah, the surface uh, to be safe. And, um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, so um, how is it for you? Do you think for next year, let's say pretend this will be going on till the end of the year, distancing or even to the summer, um, do you have work scheduled? How is that for you? How will you survive? Are you, are there, um, so is there a support system uh, in New York City you feel that is there for you? Um, Not really in New York, I don't think. I think. I think for us the situation doesn't change that much because we've never really received any support from, from the States anyway. And, you, uh, you were on the Burg Theater of Vienna, but you yeah. won't get a, yeah. a, a tiny and, uh, space in New York. No one produces you. Yeah, and and we didn't even ask for. We're doing a show in in Frankfurt in uh, in January two thousand next year, and we didn't ask them, but they asked. They wrote us like, oh, "How are you guys doing? Can we send you some money?" You know, which mm. was which was so kind and and. Un, unheard of you know people uh, we've never really that somebody that, that somebody from a theater is really worried about the artists and and understands that pretty much all our work has been canceled you know we had some teaching gigs and and uh, and touring and that was canceled in until the beginning of the year so and also all we, your teaching gigs have all been canceled by universities yeah yeah and so when we we have rehearsals that we'll be we we're supposed to do here in the summer um two of the performers are from europe we have no idea if they'll be able to get here but we are a you know we can we can do it with the three people that are in new york and then somehow teach it you know we just we always work with the limitations that's always been our modus operandi and, and I'm sure that we will figure it out and uh, the people, the theater in, in Germany is assuring us that they're doing everything to make, to make sure that, that this happens. It's important to them that, that uh, they keep doing what they, what they know how to do best. Um, and of course, we've assured them that we will also do what we know how to do best and that uh, we yeah, we have always we've worked for 15 years for for no money with uh, uh, so we will continue if the broadway theaters don't open who cares if the uh, state supported theaters don't open it, it it it's it's you know we we have done it with nothing because we have to do it. This is what we do. This is this is who we are. Um, none of us have got have 
uh, gotten into this because it's a lucrative profession or you know it's not a it's a it's a passion and we feel lucky if somebody gives us money but if they don't we're still doing it and we still will continue to do it uh, as much as we grumble about um, what an awful art form it is it's still something that we do and we'll probably keep doing it until the day we die of corona next year but that's fine <laughs> too <laughs> you know I, I just think that somehow um right now we're we're holding holding on to life so so rapidly uh but i wonder if there will come a time when this kind of life will just uh, become unlivable anyway so we'll just all say fuck it let's just start hugging each other and making out on the street and passing the corona to each other and it doesn't matter because the the being locked up inside uh and being six feet apart from each other just uh makes no sense and it's just pointless anyway so um i just uh i count on being able to find a small group of actors who are who are willing to risk their lives and i count on 15 audience members who are willing to risk their lives and uh let's just get in the room and infect each other with uh, energy and electricity and if if some corona slips out out of any one of us into somebody else then we'll just uh, die knowing that it was all worth it and we did it not alone in a room but uh, together with 20 other people inside the during a performance I mean, I know it sounds it sounds romantic, maybe, but uh, I mean, I don't know. Also nihilistic. I, don't, I don't want to. No, I mean, I don't want to live that. I don't want to. I, I I guess I don't value life that much to to like to prolong it unnecessarily um, in a prison cell. You know, it's just about like we're we're all being confined to a to a to a life sentence inside our own cells. Sure, we have our books, and we have our, uh, mo for the most part, our our favorite food. But uh, you know, for for how long do we do we survive in our separate rooms? Paul, are you? Um, I, I, I happened to go to a play the night before everything ended, so to speak. And it was the Lucas Hanath piece, which is um, called Dana H, which is a monologue uh, of Lucas, a tape. It's an actually, it's actually a tape recording of Lucas Hanath's mother speaking about the two years that she was kidnapped. And uh, it's her, it's a tape of her and the, the great actress Dee O'Connell is lip, lip syncing uh, Dana H. Uh, is lip syncing Lucas's mother. Anyway, that's the form of it. And she tells this remarkable story and it's an incredible piece of theater. And the last part of it is Lucas's mother voice, as I say, dubbed by Dee Dee, uh, talking about her work as a uh, hospice worker, which is, something she's done, done in, uh, a lot of her life and done it very well. And talking about how she helps people across the border from life beyond to the beyond. And her method of doing that, she was very good at talking people into letting go. And I'm sitting there and it's a brilliant piece of theater. It's a brilliant, I mean, Dee Dee's brilliant and Lucas and Ath, I mean, it was, and this is the subject matter of the last play I ever saw, mm -hmm. I'm thinking. And I thought, well, that's totally cool. I mean, that's completely right. The subject's right. The way it's being performed is right. And if this is in fact the last piece of theater I ever see, it'll be entirely right. Or mm -hmm. as the gurus say, you know, everything is perfect. And everything's not perfect.
there's I another mean, <laughs> I mean, it depends <clears throat> how dystopian you want to go. But um, I guess I, the plague ended. I mean, I think it's going to end. And I think it's going to end much later than, you know, I mean, the, I, I echo a lot of what Pavel's saying about um, I, I, uh, questions about cancellation versus postponement come up in my mind when I hear um, our gigs being moved. Um, and I guess the presenters have a surprising amount of, of gratitude and respect right now around trying to make everything work and push things ahead. But we have no idea how far ahead these things are actually being pushed. Um, you know, we're only officially canceled our rehearsals and we also have people coming from Europe. So there's that X factor, but we're only really officially canceled through the end of May when we had our Walker residency canceled. Um, but we all know that, you know, that's, there's a lot more cancellations <laughs> to come and it's just a shit show of rescheduling um, in the future. So I just really hope that I get to make the piece I'm in the middle of making. Yeah, yeah. That's my so modest the, hope. Yeah, it's somehow also a feeling, especially then I think in New York of kind of an end of time. So we spoke yesterday to Black Fast, you know, the Playwrights group, and they said, uh, Dennis A. Allen said, me and Dennis Allen said, my family is making last wills. You know, so much of us work in the service industry, uh, so many friends work, you know, there and uh, they all live together, work together, multi-generations. He said, this has been going on for hundreds of years. Um, we are affected by it. And he says, yeah, we don't have health insurance. We don't have the job. What, do, what are we supposed to do? And it's, uh, it's crucial, you know, that they think about survival first. And it's Artodian times in a way, what Pavel said, you know, almost like, like the signaling through the flames. And we all have to stay on the right side of madness in this time um, um, we do live on. We had RST Tanai from, uh, from Burkina Faso who said 300, no, actually 400,000 people die of malaria each year in Africa. They don't even have the money for measles vaccination, malaria vaccination. They, we, this is our daily life. You know, as Paul said, this is what the planet is experiencing. Something is deeply, is deeply wrong and uh, we have to uh, all work and say things have to change. We have to be... Um, and part of the change, Ostermeyer, which was interesting, also said, you know, let's not read any meaning into it. It's chaotic. It's, uh, it makes no sense. It will be over. Let's prepare for the fight afterwards. You know, that also, that will come for everybody. And uh, also the colleagues from Hong Kong who said, you know, this is over. It's not over for us when this is over, you know. So um, who have often have basement performances or the um, uh, Lebanese uh, artist Sahar who said, we, we, we are already forced to perform in basements. We are already can't announce what we are doing. It's risky to put people in. Now they have that on top of it. And uh, so it is a, it's a hard time to, um, to, to think about um, theater. But if you could give some advice, I don't know. We all don't know what's going on. And, but still, as an artist and people who really have experienced and shared experiences through your work, you know, your great work, which was formerly so innovative and uh, broke so many rules. And, uh, and now, we might have to also find new innovations or maybe it has to become more political, who knows? But what, what, is, what would you say to people now who are like you listening perhaps also in their rooms as audience members now, but also as young artists or mid-career artists or artists who have also already accomplished a lot, what, what, do you, what would you say to them to what to do, what to think about? Just not, not be scared. Um. You know, I always, always, if you have to do it or don't do it, if you don't have to do it, do it if you have to do it. If, if you're compelled to do it, there is nothing that should stop you from not doing it. And, uh, you know, I always find inspiration from uh, the communist, uh, from the dissidents that, that continue to make work under threat of arrest uh, in, you know the communist regime. Um, that's why I got into the into 
making art because I felt like those people survived and they continued to make work in, in their apartments and, and find ways to make the work necessary and relevant. It doesn't mean that every, every project now has to be about some kind of science fiction virus <laughs> uh, or that, um, you know, Paul, you should definitely not use the hazmat suit because you should use the opposite. You should have somebody come in with a, you know, in, in a bikini. Naked, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and bring beautiful flowers and, and, uh, and uh, show how beautiful and perfect the world is outside while in the theater it's, it's broken. Mm. Um, you know, just, just uh, I think that the, the sense, even when when um, world was falling apart for, let's say, the dissidents in the communist country, when when people were dying and being sent to the gulag or anything, there was also a, a, a humor that survived. Maybe it's gallows humor or black humor or whatever one one calls it that it doesn't disappear so that we don't all of a sudden, all, all of us have to eliminate any kind of uh, humor from, from the work uh, mm. because then, it, then someone may accuse us that we're not taking this seriously. You know, I think we're all serious artists and we all take the situation seriously, but humor is one of the, one of the tools that we have to deal with any kind of tragedy and it's cathartic uh, but it generally makes puts you in danger of being either dismissed or or make people think that you're not taking suffering or pain or tragedy seriously. But there have been many great artists in history who have who have used humor as a as a way of dealing with this. Whether it's Cervantes mm -hmm. or Gogol yeah. or any, yeah, any, 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 any people, yeah. any number of Thank people you. that, you know. Annie, what do you think? I think that, um, I love that. And I think that um, if, you're, if you're a person who, I, I'm just going to say a choreographer, but done, I mean, just on a practical level, there's you can still you know play your scales you have to when you're a choreographer you have to make you have to work on on your craft all the time not just when you're in the room with the dancers so you can work on you can work on choreography every single day um you can make material you can your uh, duets and trios and stuff can be with objects or with the space or the floor you can rethink um you can rethink the body in space over and over and over again in an interior way or outside or whatever. There's, it's not that you get a break, you know, you don't. You still have to work and figure out how to deepen your craft, even if you don't get to be in rehearsal. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that would be my advice is just to keep at it. Yeah. My, Paul, uh, I Paul what opinion, are you? Which is that um, if you're asking yourself that question, which is a very legitimate question, just for the time of the quarantine, uh, you are in a very lucky position because the stratification of different assignments here in society now are more vivid than it, even than they were before. So while we're posing this very legitimate question, there are people working 12 to 15 to 20 hour shifts trying to keep people alive that are at the maps in these uh, hospitals. So if you have the elbow room to even ask, to contemplate the question, use some of that time to do something on behalf of those forces that are right here in Brooklyn uh, that, are, that are really stressed to the max. Uh, which isn't to say, you know, throw your, throw your artistic practice in the garbage and, and um, go buy groceries for seniors and do nothing else. You know, I don't think it needs to be quite so um, 
dogmatic and, and absolute as that. But I do think we have an imposed unique amount. The thing we have, those of us that aren't working at the hospital, is a little more time. So use some of that extra time to help those people, you know, whether it's yeah. you know, getting online and, you know, you can call, you know, there's stuff. That's stuff know. one can you do so to, more, to be useful. So and that's a, that's a thought, you know. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And uh, Kelly but is uh, but then coming to the end of the time. That what we yeah. do is useless. We don't want to say what we do is useless. Mm. No, no, or that, that is the last, or that that is the last thing that we should be doing or worrying about. I don't follow. Ke Kelly, what do you? What's your take uh, on it? Uh, well, with these things, you know, like I just keep remembering, like that back when nine eleven happened, Pavel and I weren't making theater, and there was something about that time, you know, like I lost my job, and you're suddenly forced to slow everything down and um, shift your priorities and shift your thinking. And then that's when, that's when the commitment really came to start making live art and it changed our practice, you know? So I think you, the more that you can think of these inevitable um, positions that you're put in are somehow useful and a chance to slow down and dig deep and recommit and um, redefine what's important about what you do. Um, mm. the, better, the, the more we can actually take advantage of what we do have. Because what we, what what we, we do, do have is life. a lot of time. <laughs> mm. Like these beautiful uh, Japanese haikus, when your roof is broken, you can actually mm. see the moon if you do love yeah. it. It might be cold, but you do what might be raining on you. So I think, uh, I wish we could go on and we just scratch the surface of it, but we're over one hour. And, um, and maybe we check in again if this lasts longer and can see how we all look like later on, a month or two or three later. Years. And um, yeah, and um, <laughs> so let's hope you all can join in tomorrow. We have Melanie Joseph, you know, the great uh, founder of the Foundry Theater, um, together with Aaron Lensman and um, Orange Squire will talk about uh, their work. More, Melanie will also talk about her project to finance uh, ways to find ways. I know Malia Gantner is putting things together. And of course, uh, um, Taylor Mack and Kristen do the trickle up New York NYC, uh, org and to find some ways. And we also hopefully will hear from all of them, but it will be great to hear from Melanie who always in a way has also represented a social and political conscious, you know, of, the, of our community. And we hear from uh, Shahid Nadim from Pakistan and then also from India from um, Abhishek and, uh, and a great puppeteer, a woman who will join us for the, uh, for the talk. So um, please uh, do stay with us, stay safe. Um, do stay tuned also for us. And thank you all for taking your time. Thank you, Frank. I, Frank, I hope you so much. Stay. Thank you. And I hope you will stay. Thank you for thank initiating you. this. I think it's really cool. Thank you, that means a lot to me. And whatever you. you guys say really does, uh, really, really true. So thank you and, uh, and stay safe and you and your loved